Joining us now is Kachi Ophia with stories trending around the world. Hello, Kachi. We are fired. Good morning, Dr. Arvati. Good morning, Good morning. Sundun. It's great morning, to have you Kachi. back. Good Thank morning, you. Rafai. Good to morning, see you. Kachi. Morning, Kachi. Good morning, viewers. Let's begin what's trending today. Now, asides broadcasting the news and telling stories across the globe. Shining stars of Arise FC representing Arise News slugged it out in a friendly match with their counterparts from the A Media Group owners of Cool FM, Wazobia FM and Nigeria Info on Saturday. Now, Cool FM team took an early lead in the first half following a penalty. However, the first half ended in a draw after Arise FC scored from the spot kick. Now, the second half of the match started on a bright note for both teams both Arise FC conceded another goal about 10 minutes after the sound of the whistle. Now, this friendly match, which went down at the Astro soccer pitch in Lagos, Nigeria, ended two goals to one in favor of Cool FM. Perhaps, you know, we will do so much better, you know, uh, next time. But hey, it was, it was fun to see. We did so well, Kachi. We did so well. <laughs> I see you out there, Rufai. You, you did so well, Rufai. <laughs> well, I, I think it's good. Uh, you know, um, uh, I, I read some comments. Some people said it was the referee that was not fair to arrive. Yeah, the referee was not fair. You know, the, ref like, the referee did the, <laughs> Maybe the ref it's a it was a last man's uh, 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 mistake, but it's okay. It was great fun. But some of the people who saw this on social media have been saying they expected me to uh, be on the Arise FC uh, yeah. <laughs> lineup. Yeah. So I know who my friends are now. You know, <laughs> so if I tried, maybe I would be in crutches by right now. No. I know you can score goals, Dr. Uh, You're just being modest. I think it was. I, I mean, was you didn't go there. Was, hey, it was only at this one that I went there yeah. to cheer on the. Uh, today. The man. The the management of the University of Calabar in Nigeria has revealed that some lecturers have resorted to giving students scripts to write exams at homes, hotels, and relaxation places. Now, this was said in a memorandum dated Tuesday, the 10th of August, 2021, and it was also signed by the Deputy Vice Chancellor Administration, Professor Michael Peter Okom. Now, the management basically lamented over what it described as obnoxious and abhorrible acts of sorting, extortions, and sexual harassment going on in the institution. Now, over the last few weeks, we've spoken a lot about our Nigerian institutions institutions, you know, both um, tertiary and secondary institutions, and just how things are managed within the system. And it's almost as if the more we talk about it, you know, the more we learn that there's more happening, and we ask ourselves just how we can make the situation better. I mean, at what point do we get to ex sorting examination questions? At some point, you can't even validate the degrees we're going to be getting out of some of these institutions. That's really the worry there. Parents go through so much and invest trying to give their children and wards a better life. Lecturers go through so much, work so hard trying to improve the minds of the students that they're teaching. Most students work really hard and all for what? Such that when you present your certificate to a prospective employer in Nigeria or abroad, your degree is not worth the paper it's printed on because of activities like this, whereby your degree loses all credibility. We have our Exam Malpractice Act in this country, 2004, that imposes prison sentences of between three to five years, fines of up to 500,000 naira, but really what exactly, no, 100,000 naira, 50,000 to 100,000 naira. But what exactly does that do? How many cases actually are prosecuted? This memo from the school, I don't think is the right way to go. I think those specific people, rather than a, just a blanket memo, which does tend to tar the entire student body of University of Calabar and the entire teaching staff of University of Calabar, those individuals should be apprehended. They should be arrested because it's actually a criminal offense that they are committing, rather than this kind of just a blanket memo. Well, I think uh, we should commend the uh, authorities of the University of Calabar in a sense. When uh, Professor Florence will be uh, assumed office as the vice chancellor of that university, the first female vice chancellor in the 45 year history of the University of Calabar, she made as a major priority a campaign uh, against, uh, you know, sex for grace, sexual harassment, and also uh, what is called sorting, whereby students pay uh, lecturers to be able to get grades. Now, uh, now she says, look, zero tolerance for vices 
under our watch. And this is an indication of our commitment to that. Now, the information available to the university, we're told, in an interview with uh, Professor Florence Obi, uh, has been provided by students whose identity will be concealed. And these are whistleblowers within the university system who have gone to report to the university authorities. And in at least two instances, according to uh, Professor Obi, Two lecturers have been apprehended and, uh, you know, they've been sanctioned and they've had to refund the money that they collected from uh, students, uh, you know, uh, to give them uh, uh, a grades. Uh, but, you know, it shouldn't be something that should be covered up like that. As Tuno pointed out, it's an, uh, an offence. It's a crime. Sexual harassment itself is also something that should be sanctioned. However, this is not just a case of the University of Calabar. Uh, you know, other universities other colleges uh, of education, other institutions of higher learning have this same problem. And it's a reflection of the uh, moral turpitude that we face in our society, a situation whereby people are just looking for a shortcut. Nobody wants to work hard. In the past, you know, people used to sweat to be able to pass exams. They used to go to the university to go and learn. These days, you have a different culture. The students would rather pay their lecturers, go to hotels or some other places, uh, you know, of easy virtue uh, to go and uh, uh, write exams. And then, of course, I mean, what kind of academics are these? You know, what quality of teachers do we have within our system uh, that will collect money for grades? I mean, it's scandalous. But it didn't start today, but it's gotten worse. So it shouldn't be only University of Calabar. Other schools, other institutions of higher learning should pay attention to this uh, growing vice uh, within the uh, education system in Nigeria. The academic system is rotting. Mm -hmm. Let's not deceive ourselves. It's just beginning to show. I mean, we had a student that left the uh, University of uh, Benin and wrote on her shirts that uh, exam our practice brought me this far. I don't know how far they've gone with that case. Brought me this far. We also had the case of a lecturer that we had to go to jail because of sex for grades. We also had the BBC documentary about University of Lagos, cold room, slaughter slab for students, sexual perfidy everywhere in the university system. That's what Nigeria has become. It's become a microcosm. And that's why you see, when you take those degrees abroad, they'll say you should have to still come and do more exams to defend it. That's why they don't appreciate our degrees abroad. And this is the same country that used to be a center of excellence all over the world. If you had a degree from University of Ibadan or other parts of the world in the 70s, 80s, they are respected degrees. But today is not the case. Why? Where is the, where's the investment in the academic sector? Check the university rankings. How many Nigerian universities rank first 500 or first 1,000? That's where you know that we are joking. And when we say these things, people say, oh, we don't like people's face. That's why we say, we just want the country to do well. The education system is suffering. We brought the picture earlier on. I think you were the one that brought it of the uh, University of Nigeria, Onsuka, the situation of the hostel. So the students don't have good hostel. Mm -hmm. Their lecturers harass them for money. Most of these students might probably be indigent. Some that can't give them money will sell their body. That's the case of the Nigerian university system. Can we fix it? Yes. But are we ready? I don't think so. Sad story. Well, let's take another situation where the former governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria, Alaji Sanusila Mido, said during a colloquium to mark his 60th birthday on Saturday that Nigeria has made zero progress in the last 40 years. That will be since 1981. Now, Sanusi maintained that the government must make the economy grow for the sake of ordinary Nigerians. The former banker basically explained that Nigeria's GDP per capita and purchasing power parity had gone through a cycle where it grew and plummeted to nearly the amount it was 40 years ago. Now, the renowned economist also argued that fuel subsidy was unsustainable in the country, adding that had fuel subsidy been removed 10 years ago, Nigerians will not have felt less pain than if it was eventually removed today. During this colloquium as well, he lamented the current state of the nation where he called on the leaders of the country to improve the lives of citizens. Now, it's interesting, every single day, I listen to you, Dr. Abate, I listen to Refai, I listen to Tim Doon on the morning show. And we have leaders on the morning show. And, and every day we also hear comments like this, tell our leaders to improve the situation of the country. And I ask myself, 
the, the leaders are telling us to tell our leaders to improve the country. Who exactly are we asking? Because this is the situation that, this is the statement we hear a lot very often. I mean, just earlier on in the show today, Reuters brought on the story of the lady who was charged 50,000 for using her generator. And in fact, it is the law. But when you have a situation where dollar within the last few months has gone from 300 to over 500, you ask yourself, how are these businesses supposed to thrive? I mean, ideally, that may not be an issue, but probably she's not doing as well as she used to. She's probably struggling to stay afloat. And all of this compounded together is making a situation that normally might not be so difficult, immensely frustrating. So when we say we're asking our leaders to do better and we speak to our leaders and they tell us we're telling our leaders to do better, who exactly are we asking? I mean, you're asking a rhetorical question, I imagine, but it's so completely spot on. That exactly yeah. is the crux of the matter, Kachi. Everybody seems to be passing the buck and frankly stating the obvious. Nigeria is an increasingly hostile place in which to do business, in which to get an education, in which to live. We all see this and we all really do nothing apart from talk and point out the, the issues. Where are the solutions? Where are they going to come from? We're looking to political parties. We're looking to 2023. Assuming that we'll still all be here in 2023 as a nation, that's a huge assumption at this point. But when looking at, you know, the main political parties, we can see the whole melee going on with, you know, the main political parties. And the whole situation then just feels hopeless at this point. I really do hate to say that, but that's just the bottom line. You have somebody like the former Emir who is joining the rest of us to lament. And then you wonder, so who are the leaders then? Well, I mean, I commented at length earlier on on the statement made by uh, uh, Alaji Lamido, Sanusi Lamido, and uh, made the point that, look, to the extent that his intervention are factual, based on cold facts, even facts provided by the MBS, uh, food inflation is over 23%, um, uh, inflation rate is over 17.7%. Uh, Unemployment rate in Nigeria is over 33%. Capital importation has gone down. Uh, um, the foreign exchange regime, you know, we are having issues there. Cost of production is so high. He just used just one element, which is uh, purchasing power parity at the amount of disposable income that is available to the average Nigeria. And the poverty, the epidemic, the pandemic of ep uh, empty pockets uh, that we are facing in Nigeria today proves the point. As at 1980, you know, you could buy, you could travel to London twice a week and return, and you'll be able to afford it. Today, you, you, anyway, COVID won't even allow many people uh, to move on it. So we're in a very difficult place, and that's his point. Can we do something about it? As for the uh, story that you referred to, the area municipal, uh, the Abuja Municipal Area Council, trying to tax uh, people over gaseous uh, emission. They've been on it since July. Actually, in July, they, it was supposed to be 100,000 Naira, you know, per generator. And then, of course, businesses kicked. The Abuja Chamber of Commerce kicked. And then they've now reduced it to 50,000. The point that that lady that was shown in that video was making is that how much is that small generator? It's called, I better pass my neighbor. I better pass my neighbor. It's not even up to 50,000. And you are asking owners of small and medium scale businesses, people are just selling small, small things. The entire investment in some of those businesses that use a, a, a better pass my neighbor is not even up to 50,000. But the irony of it is that the Abuja Municipal Area Council is quoting the law. They're saying that Section 2C uh, of, uh, of the first schedule of the Constitution allows them to charge uh, those fees. And that Section 25 of the uh, uh, Federal Environmental Protection Agency Act also empowers them to do it. But must we kill businesses? Mm -hmm. Why don't we have regular power supply? Because if there is regular, stable power supply in the country, nobody will bother to go and buy generators. So mm -hmm. it's like trying to kill businesses. It's like trying to punish, uh, you know, small-scale businesses. I mean, for me, you see, when we hear a lot of pushback and they say, oh, things are working in Nigeria, uh, people are not just seeing it. I always say this. I say, see, even a clock that is bad is correct two times in a day. A bad clock is right twice a day. That's to show you that things are not working. I mean, you brought forward the issue of emission. What surprises me in this country is the high level of palatial hypocrisy. 
We are saying emission, but we flare gas every day in this country. The gas we ought to use in producing electricity is flared every day. In Port Harcourt, they have problems with suits. That's emission. Who is going to charge the government for the flaring of gas and the emission that goes out to the air? Who is going to charge for that? Who is going to pay the emission taxes on that? And somebody would have thought that that gas can be converted to electricity so we can have some form of electricity, but that's not the case. So what do we do every day? We throw the baby away the, with the bathwater. We grandstand. And we say, oh, we will sleep, we will look away from the facts, and the problem will go away. A problem is there knocking on your door because it, it thinks you have a solution for it. If you don't give the so, so, uh, solution to the problem, it will not go away. It will keep knocking at the door. So it is time for us to rally around and put solutions for the problem. And once we highlight the problem, let us all work together. It's not the time that we talk about the problem. And so people will be political and partisan. You see, it's only in Nigeria that people have two ways of seeing the problem. It's either there's a PDP vision of the problem or an APC vision of the problem. We don't always collectively agree on the problem in this country. And that's the problem. That is the problem. Well, I believe we can take our final story before we wrap it up today on the morning show, where the general overseer of Mountain of Holy Ghost Intervention and Deliverance Ministry, Chikwe Mecca Ohane Mary, a.k.a. Odumeje Ndaboski, has carpeted Pastor Chris Okotie over his recent comments on the late T.B. Joshua. Now, late T.B. Joshua, who was the founder of the Synagogue Church of All Nations, died on the 6th of June, and Okotie, the senior pastor of the Household of God Church, International Ministries had described TB Joshua as a deceptive magician in a recent video. However, reacting to Okotier's comments, the popular Onitsha-based cleric in the now viral video described Okotier as a possessed man who is suffering from insanity. Well, Kachi, um, I thought beefs were the preserve of rappers, not pastors. This is quite <laughs> shocking to me. And the only hope that for, I have for this situation, or should I use the Christian parlance, the only redemption that's possible here is if Pastor Okote does not respond, if they both come to a place of personal repentance, they should go read the book of James that talks about conflicts within the church, and they should mend relationship and really help the church's witness to the society and, you know, restrain from this kind of carpet as you put it. Well, Pastor Chris Okoche referred to uh, the late uh, Pastor Timmy Tokwe Joshua as the wizard at Endor, uh, and he was uh, describing him as a fake prophet. This rivalry among these Pentecostal pastors has been there, even in the, during the lifetime of uh, Pastor Timmy Tokwe Joshua. But what I find shocking is that uh, the lion himself, that's uh, Pastor Dumeji, in the Boski Pahosi, as he describes himself, you know, was talking about violence. He said if he sees uh, uh, Okoche, he will slap him, give him a dirty slap to correct his senses. And that if he tries to challenge him, he will kill him. Uh, what happened to those passages in the Bible that talk about, you know, forgiveness, about loving your neighbor as yourself, about turning the other cheek? Now we have reached a point in Nigerian Christendom that you have a pastor who says he's the lion, he's in the Boski Pahose, and that he doesn't forgive people. Anybody, he will kill the person. I find it very strange. I don't know what, uh, you know, they do in some of these churches. You know, okay, well, I think we have to go catch it. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Uh, <laughs> we'll see you tomorrow.